That's another word I really want to throw out there for what I love about what I do is I get paid to play. When I'm, when I'm at my best, I'm comfy with the scene. I know your lines, my lines when the explosions are happening so that I can be in the moment and relax and let it happen for me. So when you get to be, when you work with a, an Armin Shimmerman who knows that it's a team sport, he's more comfy when he's gone in there ready to rock. It means it means something to him. I love that. Friends, how are you? This is Lee Ehrenberg. I was Damon Bach, Damon Prack, Grawl, the Telluride Ambassador, and Pelk from Voyager. It is an honor to be here, and this is Trek Untold. Hello, puppet. Trek Untold, the Star Trek podcast that goes beyond the stars. I am your host, Matthew Kaplowitz. Today in the show, I'm chatting with Lee Ehrenberg, a seasoned character actor whose time on Trek was definitely notable, but his resume expands far beyond the Alpha Quadrant. Lee has embodied a number of aliens across four different Trek series. He's played a trio of different Ferengi, starting in DS9's episode The Nagus, and again, in The Next Generation's Force of Nature and Bloodlines. Then he was the Malon garbage man, for lack of a better term, named Pelk in Voyager's episode called Juggernaut. And finally, he played the Tellrite ambassador named Graal from Enterprise's final season episodes, Babel One and United. Of course, all of those roles had Lee covered head to toe in makeup and a lot of really interesting wardrobe things, so you might not necessarily recognize him until you see his face, but once you do, you're going to know this man pretty clearly. And in that case, you might recognize him from his roles on Californication, Pushing Up Daisies, Seinfeld, Waterworld, Married with Children, Lois and Clark, Night Court, Tales from the Crypt, and many, many more things. He was also one half of the famous duo from Disney's Pirates of the Caribbean movie series, playing Pintel in several of those films, and Grumpy in the TV series Once Upon a Time. Now, being covered in pounds of prosthetics and makeup isn't necessarily a fairy tale like Once Upon a Time, but I can tell you that this actor's stories always end with a happily ever after. Lee has an infectious positive attitude about life and his career, and some really, really wonderful stories to share with all of you today. So let's cast off, beam up, and spend some time hanging out with the very talented Lee Ehrenberg. But before we start our chat with this week's guest, I want to remind you to please follow Trek Untold on social media, including Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok. You can find this show on all of those platforms simply by searching for Trek Untold. Make sure you subscribe to this show, whether that's on the audio platform of your choosing or on YouTube, where the video version of this show lives. And speaking of, make sure to check out our YouTube channel more frequently for episodes of our new mini show, Tales from Trek Untold, as well as other sci-fi goodies. And of course, don't forget to leave ratings, reviews, comments, and whatever you can do, no matter what platform you're on, to enjoy this podcast and show others that you're digging it too. If you want to support this show financially, please consider becoming a Patreon member at patreon.com slash trekuntold. Shout out to Trek Long Island, who is having their second annual convention this summer at Hop Hog Long Island. In New York from May 31st to June 2nd. Headlined by Melissa Navia from Strange New Worlds, Armin Shimmerman, Chase Masterson, and J.G. Hertzler from DS9, Ethan Phillips from Star Trek Voyager, and Gabrielle Ruiz from Lower Decks. Among many other modern and classic Trek shows, this three-day event will feature autographs, panels, including some with yours truly, and other ways for you to hang out with the stars and meet your fellow fans. You can learn more about this event or buy tickets for it at treklongisland.com. Now, without further ado, let's go ahead and beam in this week's guest. Computer, access interview file. There are many actors who have done it all when it comes to roles, being in big budget franchises, hit sitcoms, and everything in between. But there are a few who can say they did it all and played a Ferengi three times. Lee Ehrenberg, welcome to Trek Untold. 
Thank you so much. What a great intro. It's glad I'm glad to be here, my bro. Oh, very excited to have you here. I've seen your face in so many things. Like you're one of those actors I just love seeing pop up in places. And I got to tell you, like looking through your resume again, I'm just like having so many great memories. So I'm really excited to dig into your career Thank today you. besides Star Trek. Oh, off to a strong start already, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> so real good. It's great to hear it. Listen, you know, we are storytellers and the real magic of what we do is when it resonates with the audience. And so for you to say that, uh, that's a beautiful thing to me. It's kind of the game. It's kind of the game, you know, to uh, combine great, great story with that bit of uh, diversion that we as humans need from our daily existence. Uh, and that's high art for me. Good book, good painting, good music, good TV show. A great plate of food, a nice sunset. You know, it all fits in there in terms of what resonates with the human soul. And so whether you be a Seinfeld, a Star Trek, a pirate guy, uh, when our work as actors connects with your, uh, in your sweet spot, the beautiful thing, man. I love that you mentioned some of the things I'm absolutely going to be asking you about as we go on today. But uh, sure. since this is a Trek podcast, I got to ask you one Trek question before we dig into everything else. Sure. Sure. Lee. What's your earliest memory of Star Trek? Did you grow up as a fan or watching it as a kid? My my older brother and my dad, for sure. I was a little too young for the Ridge. I was born in 62. Can I do have memories of 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 it fleeting they though they are. Interestingly enough, on a random note, you know, my brother became uh he's an electrical engineer that designed the james l webb telescope Ooh, wow so his interest in trek i mean i have legitimate people go boldly going where no one's gone within the family i honestly became much more a fan of its influence on fandom itself and then of course I certainly enjoyed all the spin-off shows that I got to be a part of and uh work with and then connect later on with the original players. Yeah, you in know, through the convention world and and stuff. So short short answer or a long answer to a short question, no, not to the orig, uh, but really was welcomed. And now I consider myself hardcore member of it uh with a unique star trek wiki and uh some fun facts about my existence within the world which is great you know well you're among good company today that's for sure lee now uh let me back it up a little bit further and uh i'd like to get some background info i want to get the secret superhero origin story of lee Ehrenberg. uh can you tell me where you grew up who your parents were and what they did and what did little lee want to be when he grew up Okay, I grew up in Santa Monica, California. Uh, my dad worked for a think tank. Hmm. So wasn't always sure exactly what he was up to using applied mathematics for everything from uh, military, uh, crime fighting, uh, that kind of shit. But he was an applied very scientific math. sounding family you've got there. I mean, he uh, really, you know what? I mean, it was cool. I don't know if it's that or that, uh, you know, kind of like the bar was set high with doing academics, finding your lane. I mean, we didn't really have much choice. My mom uh, worked in the library. She was a senior clerk and uh, kind of like, uh, well, librarian for a better term, ran the AV department, ran circulation. So I was around a lot of books as a kid. And yeah, academics were a priority. Uh, in my family growing up, obviously I had a genius older brother who took the smart lane away and kind of left me the, there's comedy, there's entertainment. <laughs> no other way to get a fucking attention as the second child, you know? Uh, so <clears throat> I pretty much knew I wanted to be an actor pretty early on, probably age 11. Were you someone who did like a lot of school plays and that kind of thing? I was a school play dude. Yeah. <laughs> I was, and I was actually like good in the school play. I mean, not to be like, cause my, my school district, Santa Monica unified shit. My classmates in high school, Robert Downey Jr., Emilio, Sean Penn, a pretty amazing legacy combination 
of uh, artists that came through that in, in the same time frame. That's wild. Uh, you know, they had a lot of them had way better connections into the Hollywood biz. I had zero. Right. I might as well have been from like the Jersey Shore or something in terms of like the distance. You could be you could grow up across the street from the studio and they'll never invite you in. You know, there's a lot of I, I'm a lucky dude. That is for sure. My most my superpower is I'm lucky and I turn it over. I try when I'm in that mode of, you know, I'm an awkward kind of dude growing up and I can find my posse in the theater. I can find my, you know, I I mean, I'm pretty uh, extroverted guy, but then that, a lot of that's covering up <laughs> like the uncomfortable, you know? So we're all awkward as teenagers. I mean, and luckily the theater world, the friends I made in high school, starting in middle school, junior high was, and then at UCLA where I formed uh the Actors Gang Theater Company with Tim Robbins and Lawrence Olivier, son Richard, Kyle Gass, Tenacious D, who started working with Jack when he was 12. I mean, I've been around. It's just your friends associate with other uh, high achieving guys that want it bad and women that want it bad within the arts, and you have a shot. Then I hope you're lucky. I think a lot of that might have to actually do with your background because you were around a lot of very high functioning people and you were able to keep up and not like crumble with the pressure. So that's kind of uh, worth getting complimented for, I think. Thank you, bro. I actually, I I wanted to be the best. I mean, in fact, I mean, it's like, I've just believed I was such bullshit. Make it till you make it though, right? Yeah. I mean, honestly, your, your ego though, like, right. I mean, it's ego until it's not, but yeah, the, the ego is probably a young man's sport. I don't think the same way about the business or about anything. And uh, what the theater taught me, though, was to root for other people. And by rooting for other actors and encouraging their development and watching them grow, you learn this as you get older, because when you're young, you just want it for yourself. And then you realize, man, it's a team sport. And the more you are a good team player, the better the show the better you are a listener. It's about more about listening in, in film and and um, than it is about you know, necessarily the words you say. Because a lot of times you just can do more with a look mm. than you can with the word. So I just always had that belief. And uh, I think it was pro- it's probably where I was been the most courageous in my, you know, existence, you know, in terms of like, Doing this, I look back at some of the shit did, you know, street theater and crazy fucking shit, bro. So I earned it. I entertained a lot of people, yeah. and proudly so. I'm an entertainer. I've I've, I've always been an entertainer too, uh, natural born, uh, which again is is a lot of times a cover for, yeah, 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 yeah. So, but, but it's kind of interesting though, because you know you make a good point that acting is a team sport. And that's something we don't really hear a lot on the show, even though it's very true. And I think that also goes hand in hand with the ability to not internalize failure. Like if you blow a gig, if you blow an audition, you're not like I'm the worst. You're also still kind of realizing, you know, it's somebody else's day. Tomorrow's gonna be my day. Something like that. Yeah, uh, I mean, it depends on how bad you need it. The game is very challenging mentally because you're definitely not going to win. Uh, you know, your percentage. And the longer you're in it, the percentage, you know, that when you're young and you do 10 auditions and you're batting, you know, you get ten, one out of 10, that's great. If you can get two out of 10 and get into that 20%, 20, 25, uh, maybe even get on a hot streak where you get three, four, five in a row, right? Mm. But certainly when you get older, man, you're going to run some cold streaks where that, you know, those numbers will catch up to you. You're going to be hitting it. Ten, you hit it 10 percent. You're going to have a career. It's a lot of failure. Right. So absolutely have to factor uh, the journey of growing yourself mentally along the way. Well, Lee, I want to keep it in the past for a minute because I was looking through your IMDb. I was watching your reel. I was looking up as much as I could with you in it. And I found like something I didn't know that you did. And then I realized, oh, my God, that's him. Um, So folks out there who are video gamers, they're going to love this story, I'm hoping here. But you were in uh, the film The Wizard. The Wizard. Yeah, yeah, I knew that. 
I went I went that far back because when I saw that credit, I was like, wait a minute, there's got to be a what story. Year was that? that wasn't even that far back. I think I'd been around for a little bit. It was that early 90s, right? Uh, early, early, early to mid 80s, let's say. Because that was when Super Mario 3 got released. Dude, I just remember I didn't know much about the movie because I never saw the whole script. I went to Todd Holland directed that, right? I believe that's right. Yes. Okay. So Todd went to college with me. Uh, and I did some theater uh, with him at uh, UCLA. And I want to think that's how it got me that part. Because I was just basically a screaming guy, right? I did a lot of screaming. <laughs> sort of famous for screaming. If there's one thing I've noticed, it is that Lee is there if you need him to scream. So, yeah, you were excellent at that part. You were well, really I mean, strong. That's my lane, you know? That yeah. is a lane. That, that was something I could do. Those high energy kind of crazy dudes, you know? Uh, that came from the theater. That came from just like... Uh, I don't know the what you want to say about the legacy of that kind of the Belushi guy that we all grew up with, and you know my own version of that. I mean, Jack has, Black has a version. Jeremy Piven has a version. A lot of us kind of came out like that. <laughs> stocky Jewish dudes with the fucking anger problem. But Story it served my life, Lee. well. It served me well though, Matt, because like I mean uh, that character on Scrubs on Seinfeld to be able to hit that comedically and then stop turn on a dime change out of it to be in control pirates i got to do it a few times you know it's served me well once i especially once i gave up road rage no, I'm just... <laughs> the secret is he never gave up road rage folks uh... <laughs> uh, no 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 i did actually i gave it up consciously when i used to live in venice many years ago oh god because i was like what happens if that's the casting director or the producer i'm going to meet right now <laughs> you know it was Point. just and I was just like, that's it. I'm like, my, I'm your traffic. You're my traffic. Because LA is, you know, you're trying to get places on time. It's fairly large. And, you know, it's a lot of like inside routes or the hot, you know, when the freeways are jammed up. And uh, are you in New York City or where are you at? I'm in New York City. Yep. So yeah, so you, we, I don't have to tell you about traffic and flows and choosing the right time. And, you know, we have a bit maybe longer run sometimes distance wise. Yes, you do. Uh, yeah. Just for like the, from Hollywood, like Burbank, I lived on, used to always live on the West side. So getting to the Valley at the certain time or vice versa back over the Hill. I mean, listen, uh, that, do you know that when I, on that Seinfeld, I didn't even want to go to the fucking audition originally because it wasn't a hit show. And I wasn't, and talk about my stupid ego. Uh, I was like, I didn't want to drive five thirty to the Valley. I just, I mean, I'll never forget just my instant reaction. <laughs> so Seinfeld, my reaction to this, you know, we used to get faxed auditions or something. Be on a Friday. They don't care about that. You know, I don't know. I was young. And uh, of course, it turned out to be the one of the best parts I ever landed. And, you know, so I obviously I never now I go and I'll spend four hours in the car happily because I learned my lesson, you know. However, uh, that reaction later in my own mind was such a Seinfeld reaction and was <laughs> evidence of why I belonged in the world. You know, I'm glad you said that because that was like one of my notes when I watched your two Seinfelds is that like you really fit in like again, again, that's because the character also was like he knew everybody somehow, but it wasn't just that yeah. like your performance. It made me believe like you knew these folks, you'd been around them before. And it, again, it's pretty cool seeing that you came back as the same character five years later, which does not really happen that often in sitcoms. No, and they, you know, uh, they were real cool to me. They liked me. And uh, that I guess that didn't always happen because I've heard Armin's stories about Seinfeld. I was like, I didn't, I'm like, I don't even relate to any of that. I will say this. They wrote, they wrote, they gave me the ball on that show. They let me be the funny guy, which was so cool. And so it's just, it was, it's where the story goes and it's why that story is still funny that show 30 years later because they allowed the comedy to go where it needed to go. So Danny Woodburn could be the funny guy. They'd give the ball away. They didn't have to keep it. They, and most sitcoms have to have the funniest lines be the stars. They don't want the guest star to get the, the funniest stuff, but Seinfeld will let them go. Let them be the soup Nazi. Let it be Kenny Banya. Let it go where it goes story-wise. And that, I mean, Jerry Stiller stuff and, oh, my God, you know, the so many great legendary uh, 
actors and actresses got to shine because of that spirit of go where it goes. Mm. And I certainly benefited again, the lucky that that was the deal. It wasn't that way on every sitcom, you know, sitcom is, is a sport where you literally need to bat 1000 or the joke goes. So your job is to get a laugh every fucking time on that material, you know, um, a lot harder. And I learned how to ride the wave of the big studio audience from Jerry. Cause you're nervous and, he doesn't want to miss out on his laughs, but he wants the rhythm right. I mean, there was a lot to learn, you know, for me uh, from those guys. And I guess that would have been 1993. I was still a young dude, you know, professionally. Um, so to toe a mark next to legends, right? Legend. They weren't legendary when I towed the mark, but in the in the time since, they've become led. All those characters are legendary characters. That. So many of us in this business know that that's the coolest deal. So you can always say, I know I did it. You know, you have, you can go forward with the belief that it doesn't get any better than that show. 40 million people. That was it. You know, standing next to Johnny when he's the number one movie star. <laughs> it doesn't get any better than that. Standing next to some of these cats when they are at the height of their game and you're you're just there, as, whatever your role is, you're playing with them. It's ultimate rush. Man, I'm glad you brought up Pirates, in fact, because I, 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 we have to talk about Pirates. It goes without saying. It's like one of, I feel like, the biggest landmark parts of your career. Uh, and yeah. you know, I know you've talked in depth about this a lot. But I think my big thing is just wondering, you know, how you survive those shoots, because in my mind uh, and seeing some of the behind the scenes footage that, that you've shot for your diary with the movies uh, is like it seemed like a pretty grueling kind of thing. Like it was fun, but it also seemed like it was hard work. Oh, the work is, I mean. No question, but we never really work as hard as the crew works. On a, on a movie like that, the crew goes through you know i'm on my computer in my trailer playing poker back in the day or whatever you know waiting for them to call me sometimes there were pucker moments that were scary but treat everyone around you really nice so your safety crew is looking out for you because when they roll action we're playing the character it's not my job to if i catch on fire it's somebody else's job to put me out you know i have to go out there and go like what that exploded my face <laughs> you know right so they were grueling they were long shoots uh, they were magical i loved every second of it you know you have to want to be there man that's the game you have to i i actually said uh, basically i mean it's before gratitude was a freaking thing yeah. Uh, I practice daily gratitude on that. That's that was the answer to like, especially when we hit Pirates two and three, and I had sort of gotten the bit of the bump up with Mackenzie on our characters, and now we have our own scene, and we're real Shakespearean clowns, and I'm living the ride. Uh, daily gratitude. That's a great way to put it as like Shakespearean clowns. When you really like look at the material that you're doing and the way you're performing it, that totally fits. And that's, yeah, that's like, R2 I, I, want, I know there's a lot of like parallels to Laurel and Hardy. I've, I've heard R2D2 and C3PO, but you guys are really very much like classic clowns. Yeah, but so are the, so are Laurel and Hardy and R2D2 and C3PO. That's true. They comment on the action, you know, different strata, societal stratas within the world. You can't have all captains on a pirate ship. Somebody's got to fire the cannon. Somebody's got to swab the deck. Right. So um, we, you know, the in the same way that uh, uh, good stories, a lot of times we'll have that perspective from the different uh, Downton Abbey has the, you know, upper house, lower, lower house. And that's that's you got to know it's one of the more important things we figure out when we uh, analyze script and kind of figure out who we are as as characters in a story, where do we fit in to the hierarchy of this world? Who do we high status over? How many people? I mean, Pintel and Rigetti, uh, you didn't have a lot of status. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, when they went off on their own, uh, you know, that then suddenly they're looking out for themselves. Then as soon as they get caught trying to steal the black pearl they're like oh we were just getting it ready for you they know right away to jump in under gibbs's 
or whatever. Great writing. Let's be honest. Let's give credit on all these shows. All the ones we've touched on track. Seinfeld had one of the great writing rooms in TV history. Comparable, I would say, only to potentially Sid Caesar uh, show of shows. Yeah, maybe the two of the greatest ever for legendary. All the guys that came out of the Seinfeld room. It's like a coaching tree. Are you a sports guy at all? A little bit of sport. Not so much team. Not so much the team based stuff, but yeah, more of the. Well, I'm just saying sometimes they'll talk in the NFL about like how all the head coaches spawn from one guy's staff. The coaching tree. Hmm. Well, there's writing trees too, where shows showrooms that show of shows of Sid Caesar, where he had like, you know, Mel Brooks and Carl Reiner and Buck Henry and Woody Allen all in the same writer's room. And then you go to Seinfeld with with all the greats in there, the Greg Daniels and the Larry Charles, not to mention Larry D and like Carol Leifer and all these people that, you know. Ted and Terry that wrote Pirates, wrote Shrek, wrote Aladdin. Without the script, man, all the shows that we're going to talk about this morning, all the TV, TV especially needs great writing because you need 23 scripts, you know, a year. It's a huge, huge part of the process. We can unlock a bad script, great acting sometimes, some scenes of it. But a lot of times, not enough to like really make it a winning deal. But if you have a strong script, it's pretty tough. To- I I definitely agree with everything that you're saying. But I think we're being a little bit too humble here because you know you've had a lot of great things to work with as far as material. But really, you know what I said about Seinfeld, I can say that about anything you've done. You find a way to get that instant rapport, and great writing will, will help you with that. But at the end of the day, it's up to the performer to figure out how to yeah, connect with the person they're next to. Yeah. I like people, bro. I'm connecting with you right now. You know, it's not hard to do. We're humans. Uh, That is a gift. That is another superpower. I'm lucky and I'm a people person. I live on a beach thanks to like my family and my life and whatever, how I ended up. And I'm a few steps out my front door with my dog and I'm on the sand. And there I am. I go out there to connect to myself, to the nature and once in a while to other humans. You know, uh, I'm, I'm just available. I like it. I need it. You know, I'm a minister of good vibes, you know, and, and spirit. And, and, you know, I'm living proof that, I mean, I don't know. Dreams come true. Sounds like bullshit, but, um, that you can live a good quality life and be a dreamer and, you know, an artist in this world still, I mean, it gets harder by the day, but I, I'm just feel very grateful for, you know, to be able to be here and be actually that someone gives a shit about my work. <laughs> you know, like it's neat, uh, you know, not lost on me that it's cool. But Lee, let's beam into our Star Trek discussion right now. We got a whole bunch of things to talk about with this here. And I want to start with the, the trio of Ferengi roles here. So you were Grawl on DS9's episode, The Nagus, and then you were Proc and Bach, respectively, on uh, the TNG episodes, Force of Nature and Bloodlines. Now, before you stepped into the role of being a Ferengi, had you ever auditioned for anything else on Star Trek before? First of all, Junie Johnson, Junie Lowry Johnson, uh, <sighs> epic, epic. We we owe so much to our casting directors as actors, right? Um I read a lot for Trek, all of the different shows over the years, a number of different roles uh, that even, and some I didn't obviously get. Pretty sure the Nagus might have been one of my first ones when I, you know, for Deep Space. All right. Um, yeah, got lucky on that one. I didn't know what I was getting into, you know, exactly in terms of all of it uh, with the prosthetics and stuff. I had done some work with some of that prior to. Uh, but yeah, that was a whole delicious world, a whole, a whole magical world, you know? Tell me about that. Cause that's the big thing. Uh, Frankie makeup is not easy. It's definitely one of the harder makeups to get into. And if someone hasn't done a lot of heavy prosthetics before, it's gotta be probably a little yeah. bit daunting. Yeah, I was young and, and, you know, it was fun. Uh, trying to think who did my first makeup on that one. I can't remember now who was my first artist on there, but they are all that, that team that the, those guys are just legends, you know, the business of uh, effects, makeup, 
the legends of the business uh, and starting with Mike Westmore and his whole team there on the, on the shows at uh, Paramount. Yeah, it was brutal. You know, it was, it was like a four o'clock call. Usually guest stars are first in the makeup stars. Didn't want to be in the first, you know, in the chair, they had rap times that probably had them at later call times. Uh, so you were looking at a four hour, three and a half to four hour application of makeup and being chased around all day to keep it looking good. And then an hour cleanup at the end. Um, but it's totally transforms you. It was magic. I used to walk around the studio and visit my buddies <laughs> that had offices. Uh, it was great. I, I loved it. that show was honestly Trek was the highest paying. If you got a guest star, because of the overtime and all the makeup hours, that was an incredible break for that quarter, that year, whatever. It was just a, those guest stars, especially the ones that worked a few days or even a run of the episode. Whew, that was nice. Because you just got, I mean, you're getting base pay, but with the overtime, it was worth it to get there early and get in the chair. Even half the time, I was still half in the bag from being a Hollywood hipster. You know, like, ah, ah, ah. oh, that four o'clock call. Jeez. I think one of the cool things about your DS9 appearance is besides the fact that you got to work with Armin, you're also in an episode of Wallace Shawn, who I'm yeah. dying to get on this show. Uh, did you get the cross paths with Wallace while you were filming that? I mean, when you're once you lock into that makeup, we're all in hell. Let's be honest. Yeah. You're not chitty chat chat. Armin, however, I want to give Uber Mensch notes to. I had a monologue pretty much day one on that sh on that episode where my character is is doing an Iago on Quark. And it was like a page monologue, you know? And so Armin came up to me on the day and just offered to run lines with me. Like pure fucking old school mensch actor. Let's run this so that you're comfy. And he did. I took advantage and man, it made my welcome a lot easier uh, to set and to the, my nerves and my ability to deliver, you know, under the pressure of of remembering all those freaking words, you know? <laughs> I mean, across all my interviews I've done on this podcast, folks who have done DS9 who did Quark heavy episodes, they they said a lot of those things about Armin too. They said the same things where they he'd rehearse with them on some occasions yeah. he'd invite them over. And even if you're a guest star or a regular, it was the same treatment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, a great, great, great man. And uh, just to, that's cares about the other actors. Great lesson for a young actor. Uh, I had a few other actors in my career that did that. One woman on a soap opera once when I was on uh, Santa Barbara, the soap opera. She was a multiple Emmy Award winner. And she's like, let's run our lines. I'm like, what? I was so young. I was like, that's, that's. I'm a theater kid. Love it. It helps so much. The more you do, Anthony Hopkins once said he would say his lines I I I, so I read this before I did Pirates, and he said that he would uh, uh, do his lines 200 times aloud in his hotel room before he ever went to set. Aloud is the key. So he hears the character in his mind's in in his own ear, and it doesn't throw him when he's like, "Can't he feel that?" <laughs> you know, he's able to play. That's another word I really want to throw out there for. What I love about what I do is I get paid to play. When I'm, when I'm at my best, I'm comfy with the scene. I know your lines, my lines, when the explosions are happening, when we're going, uh, you know, the entrance is happening here, what's going on so that I can be in the moment and relax and let it happen for me the first time. Because you got to make it, it's got to happen the first time every time. So when you get to be, when you work with him, an Armin Shimmerman who knows that it's a team sport, he's more comfy when he's gone in there ready to rock. It means, it means something to him. And I love that, you know? So that was a great opener on DS9. 
So that was my first, I want to believe that was my first uh, appearance. And then my next on the, the force of nature is I think I'm just on another ship. Yeah. That one, you weren't actually with the crew. You were being, uh, I assume you were filmed separately and they kind of just cut you in later. Yeah. So but in, uh, was, but in obviously in the in the episode Bloodlines, I got to kind of like play arguably in the card game of Trek. I'm the most cunning character. Uh, I've seen Patrick say that, or as Picard anyway, that Damon Bach was his arch nemesis. I don't know. Like, I don't know. You know, uh, we're playing make believe here. What a fun character. I and mean, Damon Bach is very, very villainous. He is, you know, a- he is the mustache twirler. Let's let's face it. He is that kind of guy. Uh, and I yeah. love that you got to have some face to face time with Patrick Stewart. And you also got to work a little bit with Ken Olant, who was a guest in the show as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but I'd love to hear, you know, any memories you have of working with those two. But especially what's it like being around Patrick and keeping in mind this is season seven TNG. So Patrick, I hear is a lot loosey goosey. And this is the end of the series. You're one of the last episodes before the finale. So, I mean. What do you remember about working with him and maybe just the general feeling? On do you, I, you know what I really remember about him is that is that loosey goosey and in that Cosmo. Is that right? The script supervisor for all the shows, the scripty. I don't sure. double check that. I don't remember off the top of my head. Okay. Anyway, they had such a relationship. Patrick would have a line of whatever, a chunk of, of tech, tech speak. And he would just have, him, it would just kind of get read to him. He would just could remember it. You know, I don't know. It was pretty neat. I was in awe. I'm a fan. He, he has an aura about him. All the captains have an aura. Every, every freaking captain has an aura. I didn't get to work with Avery. I did, you know, obviously had a lot of time with Scott Bakula, who I really love. and. Uh, Kate Mulgrew, I didn't get to tell her this when I was actually working with her because it was a busy set and we didn't really have any face-to-face time. But she encouraged me to go professional when I was 22 years old after seeing me do a play. And we're sitting at a bar and she goes, you got to quit your job tomorrow. And I did. So I, and she gave me great advice. She was married to a theater director at the time, Bob Egan, who, uh, worked uh with how was working with and anyway that so there was a lot of full circle to to my track connection um but pat stewart i'm i mean i just think he's a, one of the great actors and just a cool dude and absolutely his the casualness and comfortableness and maybe familiarity of season seven s- ceased to exist when action was called hmm. I never saw anything other than ultimate professionalism, uh, you know, from him as another actor when the cameras were rolling and we're going mustache, I'm mustache twirling and he's mustache twirling. <laughs> um, again, what a thrill to go toe to toe with fucking Sir Pat, you know, be honest. I'm, I'm very grateful for that part of the journey to include that, uh, that character. And you were correct that script supervisor was the late Cosmo Genovese. So shout out to Cosmo. Cosmo, incredible Hollywood character. I, 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 I to ask some other guest stars along the way, or even series regular stories of that cat, because he was on. If I'm correct, he did all the shows. So he, you know, that did. Uh, those are the guys in our business that make the business run. Good scripties, good ads, good crafty, the legendary costumers of Star Trek, the makeup department. I mean, let's be honest, man. It is a team freaking sport. Your camera, all these, not it's a it, it is a million percent team sport. And it's the actor's challenge. It's probably the hardest part about being a guest star, especially on television, is we work better when we feel like we're part of the family. So the sooner that we get embraced, uh, it's a shitty week in TV when people aren't into you. And it's just like, you just, yeah, I worked with Henry Winkler on a show and he made me have lunch with him on the very first day. You know what I mean? It's like, he makes you feel welcome. The legends of the business make the guests feel welcome. Make the extras, the background artists feel welcome. Respect, learn the crew guys' names when you're there for a study the fucking call sheet, people. 
Learn who you're working with, your focus pullers, your camera guys, all your makeup. I mean, it's big part of the people skills is, is um, you know, I was in, in Czech Republic on Dungeons and Dragons fighting dudes with fire, wearing a giant beard with spirit gum, a total flammable, like midget guy, like torch guy, you know, uh, you, I thank God I was nice to everyone up to that scene. They were all standing there with buckets ready to put me out. Everyone on the crew, you know, it's more important. Be that guy. Learn their names. It's their their people, and and they make the they make the sport. And so for late Cosmo, just I mean they 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 help directors, actors, everybody. They carry the information. It's like they're the alchemist of the of the of the of the story. They have how long the shots are, how it fits together. They time the shot. They know where the cameras are set up. The details within the book of a good script is just like be a real excellent read for all the hardcore uh, fans out there. Mm-hmm. Real uh, machinations of what we do. It's it's jig, three-dimensional jigsaw puzzle making. That's one of the reasons why I do this show. I like getting those stories. I like getting into that nitty-gritty stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that is the neat stuff. Yeah. How do they pull the shots off watching the, even though like Napoleon, like they're that when they analyze how he did the scene of the uh, uh, Ridley Scott and the horses on the lake. And I mean, it's, that's what the pirate stuff for me, the, this frame by frame, how do we pull these stunts off these Rube Goldberg um, esque action sequences pirates too, with the giant wheel, it breaks off, it rolls. And the guys are sword fighting. We call it the three-way sword fight. All those shots are figured out ahead of time and storyboarded in. And then uh, yeah, above my pay grade, I mean, honestly, bro, I just love that I'm, you know, that that they need short, bald, and crazy as much as they do. It's funny you mentioned that, that wheel stunt too, by the way, because on the show a few years ago, we had Tom Morga, who was oh. uh, part of the team on that, doing that scene. Oh, uh, yeah. And well, Tom, Tom was one of the Black Pearl Pirates too from the first movie. Yep. So these legendary guys, legendary stuntmen like Tom, uh, <laughs> you know, they're on the rowboat. We're all acting our storm up and they're like, all. they're not only making sure we're safe, but also giving a performance. Mm-hmm. Some of the great people. And that's they're the most, I, my stunties, dude, I owe so much to them. We're all part of the play of the same character when, when you're being doubled, let's say. Um, oh yeah. Tom Morga legend. Hey everybody, we'll get right back to the interview in one second, but I wanted to remind you all to check out Trek Untold over at Patreon. Patreon is the best way to directly support creators of things you like through a monthly subscription of an amount that you can choose. Trek Untold has a few different tiers already with different benefits, ranging from early access to episodes, the ability to ask a future guest questions, exclusive merchandise, and other bonuses that I'd love to offer But first, I need to grow that Patreon community to do that. Trek Untold has been around since mid-2020 and has grown a ton since then, thanks to listeners and viewers like you. Through a platform like Patreon, you can help me keep improving the quality of each episode and keep bringing you new interviews with folks that make the Star Trek universe what it is. If this community can grow more over on Patreon, I can offer new perks like watch parties, exclusive Trek Untold episodes, being able to directly interact with guests, and other things, but in order to do that, I need to know my audience wants these things. The best way to tell me what you want is by supporting us on Patreon, so please check us out at patreon.com slash trekuntold today and become a bigger part of the Trek Untold family. And now, back to the interview. So, Lee, I want to ask you about your Voyager appearance now. Uh, that's Juggernaut. You played a Malon in that episode uh, alongside uh, Ron Canada, another former guest of Trek Untold here. Uh, what a cool uh, dude. Ronnie absolutely. Canada. And uh, who else was in that? We had another guy. We had a couple other guys in that episode with us. Uh, who else is in that one? Got another friend in that one that I remember. Yeah, you know, I have to double check. Are you, are you talking about the guy who was the big bad monster in that one? Yeah, and then there was another Malon, I think, too, with us. It was another Malon briefly. It was mostly you and Ron Canada, the majority of the scenes when you're on board that big ship. Yeah. Incredible. Um, what do I remember about that? The most memorable, besides working with Ron, flying that little spaceship around, the neat episode. I love that the Malons had the most beautiful planet. And the price for the most beautiful planet was hauling this toxic waste off it. And uh, 
then the legend of the Bahir, I think is what we called it or something like that. But it was sort of like a toxic Avenger, but it turned out to be just a got burned with the sludge or something. I mean, it was pretty cool, right? Um, it's a pretty scary episode in a lot of ways. Pretty messed up episode. Yeah, it was good. My, I had a, I got killed in that one. I love it. Screen deaths are the best, man. Uh, you, you know, you want to get a few in your career. Like if you're a, a bad guy, you got to go down a couple times. Um, and even a good guy once in a while. The makeup, really neat makeup character they came up with for the Malon. And uh, I remember I had one of the more difficult experiences of makeup in my career in the death scene. Because normally, right, you're wearing that 12, 14, 16 hours under the makeup. So even though they're constantly touching up edges on you, uh, your natural sweat and oils of your skin loosens it a wee bit and, and allows for it to come off. Within the first few hours of application, it's stuck with medical adhesive. It's on there tight. And so I remember I suited up as Pelk. And then played a couple scenes and then my death scene was scheduled. So then they put another makeup over the top of the Pelk makeup, a burn, because it was kind of a steam effect of a burn. And then they wrap me after I just laid on the floor dead, (laughs) they discovered me. And so that shit was stuck to my face. Like, I I mean, it peeled off, I want to say four layers trying to get cleaned up that day brutal so i do remember that most vividly and then of course you know ron canada is kind of a legendary dude he's sneaky long too he sneaks up in a lot a lot of shows uh you'll find him on so many episodics playing just a variety so what a fun great there's so many great character actors in hollywood and i consider him to be one of them and that's the nice thing about Star Trek is you really get to cross paths with a lot of very prolific character actors. So yourself included too. I mean, you get to work with a lot of really cool people and you get to be part of that world. Got to be able to project through that makeup, bro. Yeah. That was part of the deal with the guys, you know, in terms of the alien crew. And obviously, you know, everybody's cast on physical for physical uh, reasons. Ferengis are short. Klingons are big, right? So you're, you're not going to have a five foot Klingon. You're not going to have a six foot Ferengi. So when you're on the burlier side, say when I was a Ferengi, I'm a little burlier than us, than, and I'm short and burly. I got to be Damon's and more bellicose kind of characters. Uh, Pelk obviously was a, he was a young guy, young officer. The most memorable, I mean, Garrett, that crew was great. Uh, we had a lot of scenes on our own ship, right? So. Yes. A lot of that was just our own kind of crew stuff. Uh, Like I said, I wanted to have my moment with Kate, which didn't happen at that time uh, because she literally told me to get, become a pro, quit my computer job. I was doing the theater uh, and to play into sold out houses all over town or whatever, but I was still, you know, I hadn't made the, the transition. I just, gotten my first agent and i was just it was young 23 24 i know you do a lot of the conventions here and there i don't know if you've done any with kate before but i mean have you ever actually had your chance to thank her in person for it i really haven't i mean you got that's a one-on-one i can't just do that out of the blue i'm just not that person it would have to be an organic moment for me to share that uh otherwise it might just seem i don't know lame and usually at those conventions, uh, if I'm at a show where she's at, because she's, you know, a captain level, it's probably a big show. And I, I haven't quite been in the green room at the exact moment with the right thing. It would take a second to do it. I, I know that it's coming eventually. <laughs> I, just because it's a great story. And, and you know, now I've had a, I've been a professional pushing 40 years based on that one convo. It It was really neat. And it was... There's another actor, Adam Baldwin, who said the same thing to me uh, maybe a year earlier. And I was probably still at UCLA at a party. And he was talking about the difference between turning pro and not pro was that the pro needs it that little extra bit more. Mm. Because they never had a waiting. I never had another job after that, dude, other than the acting. I was going to die on that vine. I never waited a table or sold a computer or, 
you know, uh, from that conversation with Kate, when I made that decision, that was do or die moment in terms of uh, putting myself out there and all my intentions and all my energies and all my availability. And for 20 years, nothing got in the way of that. I was either doing theater or working or working auditions or in class 20 straight years from that choice, you know? And then that's what it takes. So Lee, you got one other Star Trek appearance to talk about. And that's a big meaty one right there. We're talking hey, now hey, hey. Enterprise oh, season four as Ambassador Grawl. Uh, and you are a Tellarite this time. And you know, I know we've talked a lot about makeup with your Star Trek roles because you are heavily made up. But I've heard from a lot of folks who did Enterprise. The makeup was just a whole other level. Do you, oh, do, you yeah. do you feel that way about that? Well, I do know that they didn't know. No one had ever. The only other time the Tellarites were ever, I think, on screen was the Babel episode in from the original. Yeah, way when back. The makeup artist took a pig's nose from a mask and cut it off and attached it in this whole thing. So it was still based on that original Babel episode. Um, that makeup was probably the worst of all. Uh, glued eyelids. Uh, there was beard. That was pure, a huge fat suit. <laughs> that was a torturous, like, fucking makeup, but a fun character. And again, with Scotty back, that whole cast was awesome. Uh, and Jeff Combs and stuff, uh, a lot of fun. A lot of fun to go with Shran and do all that Shranning. Yeah, you know, Jeffrey Combs, they have like a joke in the Trek world how Jeffrey Combs actually plays everybody in every episode. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's really fun seeing you guys play off each other because Combs is just such a, a polished actor, no matter what he's doing, no matter what role he's in. He is that character. Uh, you know, what's it like to work with a guy like that face to face? You know what? I mean, I I think that it, it, it he's he's mercurial. So, you know, it's just that when he got into that blue shit he, and those ears are working and the servos are in his head, just I, it's fun as hell. Let's be honest. You know, I, I am a huge Scott Bakula guy. I was a huge quantum leap fan. Uh, he's, he was one of the nicest guys I'd ever worked with, uh, in a big, you know, he's a big, handsome, warm, just wonderful dude. And just, so to co combine those two energies and then here am I, the little angry, I'm a Tellarite, you know, it, Fun as hell. And the funny thing is I I worked for almost a full week before I ever met uh, Jeff out of makeup because of our call times. And then we're in the parking lot parking four in the morning one time. And I'm like, hey, I'm Lee. I'm Jeff. Hey, nice to meet you, dude. Because <laughs> you know? you're, otherwise we're in the chair and I only know the blue head and he only knows whatever. God, that pig face. Uh, tell her right, dude. No, it's wonderful. I, it's funny how the makeup is a big part of what I remember most because, I mean, it's just uh, so transformational. I know later in life you would do the pintail with the fake teeth, but, I mean, here you are doing fake teeth for Frangie. You're doing full-on body suits, fat suits. I mean, for someone who might not be as used to doing that type of acting, what do you have to do to transition yourself to be able to emote and effectively perform? Just relax. It's going to happen. It's what you signed up for. That's a big part of it on the day. Relax. Know what you're in for. Know what's going to fucking suck. Set yourself up for that. So then it's like, oh, well, you can't get to me that way, right? Because I already know that I'm going to have to possibly, by, by saying yes to this opportunity, I'm, in, I'm suiting up. It's going to be uncomfortable. Save that complaint. The number one lesson for an actor, professional actor, is, you know, the... The easiest way to get an actor to complain is to give him a job. <laughs> so just don't do that. Save it. Save it for a week. If you if you're real nice the first week, you're grateful. You're you're you deal, you work with this makeup, you you're in on time for touch-ups, you just show up. What happens around you is room to be uncomfortable, room to <laughs> complain once you've got a few days in in the suit as a nice guy they'll handle you they can say oh yeah it's they'll take care of you if you come in and bitch the first day about what's wrong with everything so 
Part of it is knowing what you're getting into. Pintel and Pirates, I suited up. I would do a fresh head shave, fresh beard shave. And then that was that was wig, that was beard, that was eyeballs, that was teeth, that was full painting of my body. So that was 300 times into it. So you just have to relax. You just have to enjoy. You just have to know, hey, I get to talk to Kira Knightley, Johnny Depp, Jeff Rush today, or maybe who's going to be next to me in the Trek chair. Oh, man, Scott Bakula. Oh, wow, René Abergenois. You never know who's going to be in the chair next to you on that, in that world, right? Yeah. So cool. These are Oscar winning makeup people. There's I mean, there's plenty of good stuff to talk about and relax into. And then when you're relaxed in the chair, the makeup goes faster. It's fun. You're on the clock, babe. Just enjoy it. Yeah, it's funny you're saying things like relax underneath all that makeup, but there you are on a telerite mask. And I'm wondering now in my head, like, can you actually even see beyond just what's right in front of you? I mean, do you remember how confining that gear was? Uh, if I remember correctly, <coughs> auditory sense was most affected by the Ferengi butt heads. Right. You'd, you'd lose a lot of your hearing uh, out of it. It kind of led to a character play because you could play to the big ears a little bit because you can hear <laughs> the cues. Uh, y- the Telluride, they glued my eyelids or some crazy thing. Wow. So that, I'd have that to sounds horrible. Look- I'd have to look at that. I haven't studied that makeup in a while, but yeah, there was some horrible in that one. And uh, it the beard was itchy. Yeah, that one sucked. I was happy when that came out. But I love playing that guy because he was, I would walk around uh, the lot in that character too. <laughs> great work. Great. I think Steve Anderson maybe or on that one. I had Mike Smithson do my makeup there. I mean, and Q doing my makeup on that show. I mean, legendary dudes in Hollywood, legendary guys. And then, of course, when I ended up on Pirates with a V. Neal and Joe Harlow leading the makeup department, the artists I got to work with there, many and many, if not all of them, had been on track. So there's just so much crossover. And this it's an incestuous business, if you will. You all, you, you may not see that guy for 10 years again, but if you you tend to run into some of the same people and it's like it's that one when you're a guest on a show when the assistant prop master goes oh that's that guy once i got pirates once i kind of had some more established roles my greeting on the set was different you know uh but establishing your sense of belonging so you can relax and deliver a performance Starts in that makeup chair in the morning. Starts in the way you show up and go into your room. Starts in the way you order your breakfast burrito. Happy to be there, relaxed. You're not going anywhere for 12 hours. Just chill out. Have a good day. You're there to deliver a product. And it's best served uh, from a relaxed, centered, and open start. And then the rest of that angst, the rest of the character stuff is layered on. Very rarely do you need to go into the method. There's times when you do, when you're playing a scene where you need to be locked in the whole day and you can't, you know, it's better for you to to stay locked in. But very rarely on material, honestly, like the Trek stuff or the comedy stuff, it's better to kind of jump in, occupy it and get back, you know. Staying in it to some of it. Sometimes it's a little too actory, you know. And this is might be now the nerdiest thing I ask you during this entire interview here. But your DS9 character was named Grawl. Your Tellerite years later is named Grawl. Did anybody remember that? No. Did the anybody only people, care? I guess I remembered it. They don't. They they used up all the names. I don't know. I mean, <laughs> honestly, Alex Rickberg. <laughs> it's always been a Brandon Braga, one of those dudes. I don't know. I mean, it made me, tr- it made, it adds a little bit of trivia. I don't know. It's probably like Smith in, uh, they were different species too. Exactly. Like this doesn't happen in Star Trek. They're usually like on the ball, this kind of thing. That does not happen. They always have, you know, you look at the Vulcans, their names are a certain way. You look at Klingons, they're a certain way. Apparently, Tellarites and Frangi share names. I think it was probably, a, yeah, it was so weird that that's what happened, to be honest with you. I, that would be a great question for, that is an ultra nerd, but it is a, it's an interesting, it's one of the facts along with all, he's one of the few guys that was in all the spinoffs till the new show came out kind of a thing. But now I'm pretty much left only with the, they used his name twice. Yeah, I've, I've reduced it. 
All right. So, Lee, as we start to wrap up this interview here and we start to move away from Trek once more, I do have one final Trekkie question for you. Since you have played multiple roles as different species, which one was your favorite and which one would you say was the most challenging? My favorite, Damon Bach. I like the mustache twirling. I would actually say the most challenging was probably the first time I did it was the DS9 only because just it was a whole new world. You know, and I had yet to, I, I was, it was seemingly a new deal that I don't know when we appeared. It was season one, right? That one was season one. Season one, yeah. Middle of season one. Pretty early on. So it was pretty new for all of us, that kind of giant factory of the prosthetics and the process. And uh, it was super exciting. And like I say, I owe a big debt of gratitude to Armin for making me feel welcome that first day running lines with me. And uh yeah, I think my nerves, honestly, the biggest thing a lot in this business really to get over the most challenging thing is just that initial, like, uh, your own brain. Once you get going, once you get down there, once you start suiting up, it comes, it's more natural. If you do your preparation, being prepared helps a lot. So this next line of questions here, this is kind of encompassing your entire career. This is the lightning round for Lee Ehrenberg. Uh, what good. would you say was the best day on any job you've had and the worst day on any job you've had? Wow. That's a tough question, dude. Cause I've had a lot of great, great moments in, in that I've really, really enjoyed. I get a big rush every time rap is called and it's been a full day. Hard to beat a sunset being the last boat off the Black Pearl, mm-hmm. watching the sun go down over the Caribbean, uh, my fake wig flopping in the breeze. I mean, I would say those were some of the best days. Um those pirate days in the Caribbean, uh, sunset on a speedboat heading back to the island. <laughs> That's pretty badass. Um, the worst days, man, very few and far between. Honestly, I had a bad mask once on the show called Angel that burned my face. That was a bad day in the, at the in, in the saddle. Had some uncomfortable days, a lot of stuff like that, but it comes with the territory. I've had very few bad players to work with. Most people are come with great spirit, uh, inclement weather. I mean, I had plenty of that. I think minimizing the bad days is key to it. I would rather have a shitty day on set than a ba- than a great day not working. That's for sure. You know, I enjoy the work, so I would give Angel that unfortunate time with the bad mask. Really hurt me pretty good. Uh, it's probably my worst day. That sounds pretty rough. I'm. Mean, it's always good to hear that when I ask that question. If someone says didn't really have any, that's a great thing. So congratulations. I mean, that's that, great to hear. Well, because I'm like you know the easiest way to you know complain is acting. We're pretty spoiled, you know. I mean, what's it? What's really so? There there have been days when other actors have been kooky or kind of stuff, but you get over it. I mean. Honestly, the real key is what do you get in the can? What's the final product? Knowing that it's a team sport. A lot of times the worst part about the game is the drive, the stress trying to get there on time in LA traffic uh, or potentially, uh, you know, something of that nature. But yeah, hard to figure out, hard to, hard to really remember. Don't focus on that as much. Part of the process is not an easy job. They're long days. Uh, you know, you're on a show, it's, a TV show starts on Monday at like 7 a.m. They tend to go later and later in the week. So you'll have your night shoots at the end of the week. So those Fridays, they call them fratter days. Hmm. A lot of times you're coming in in the afternoon and not getting home till the sun's up. So it's just part of the game. You know, you got to learn to love it. Looking at now your career, stage, screen, whatever, what's the role that if you had to tell people, just look at this one thing to say that this is Lee Ehrenberg, what is that role that you are most proud of? I mean, do I only, I only get to pick one? I'm going to pick Pirates probably. I mean, I, and not, I mean, honestly, I would always say the ones when someone goes like, who are you? What are you? I don't know you. I'm going to mention, I'm going to mention Pirates. I'm going to mention Seinfeld. I'm going to mention Trek. I'm going to mention Tales from the Crypt. I'm going to mention once upon a time. I'm going to mention action. Sometimes I might have to mention friends, but I think I'm within somewhere along those six, eight shows. I'm going to resonate with someone like who I am, you know? Uh, How about I spin that for you? Let's say what's, what was the most meaningful 
role you ever played? What meant the most to you? I'll be honest, dude. They're all lifelines. They're all, they, they, every single one feels good. That's, that's the why I do it. You know, my real answer to that is my next one. Mm-hmm. The one that I haven't got yet. Cause we are like dogs. Actors are like dogs. We live on hope. Hope you'll take us for a walk. Hope you'll throw us a bone. You know, that's the one part about this profession. You have zero control. Or if you get control, you tend to have a producer hat on too. And you, you know, you're a major, major star. So for the most of us, we need, to, it's trying to capture lightning in a bottle. We want to be the guy. You just want to walk in there and be the right guy. And that's, you got to just have faith. What would you say, Lee, is the most valuable lesson that somebody taught you, whether that's about life or acting that you still think about and use today? Well, for acting, it's um, the probably the number, there's two. One I've mentioned before, easiest way to get an actor to, to bitch is give him a job. So just don't do that. Show up with a good attitude. The other one is that they pay you for the waiting in the business. And the acting, you do for free. So all of the all the BS is what your paycheck is for. When you're invited to set, it's your chance to go for it. And always enjoy that. That's your moment to play. Everyone's going to be there for you. The job is to get the finished product. And so I think that's important, you know, to remember that that part of the art is it's on you. And so I always have a good attitude. I mean, 98% of the time I show up to work, I'm in a really good mood about it. And last question for today, Lee, what's the best thing about being a part of the Star Trek universe? Honestly, it is the fans. It is the passion. It is the fact that the the fandom of Trek created the world of Comic-Cons, created the whole industry of the autograph show, of conventions. It's it's the mother load of fandom. So being a part of it, there's no other fandom where you go to, like when I do Star Trek Vegas or a big show like that, and there will be collectors that come with the encyclopedia with everybody's autograph, every player they could get, anyone. It, it's... I owe so much gratitude to uh, the the first fans that protested against CBS getting rid of the show. <laughs> it goes all the way back, man. It was the they were they were the original batshit crazy fans, and God bless them for creating this world that I mean has opened up all the other fandoms. So it is the most powerful fraternity of of fans there, there is. I love how this interview started with you talking about gratitude and we're basically ending it talking about gratitude again, which I feel like it's very fitting now that I've gotten to know you for the past hour or so. Oh, I, I, it is, uh, honestly, it is a daily <clears throat> number one about it. You cannot practice gratitude without being in the moment. It doesn't exist without being present. And the whole key to acting is being present, showing up on the day, relaxed, open, and vulnerable to being a good listener, allowing the story to affect you as the actor. So it's, you know, I I had to learn to practice it daily. I was aware that it was part of my DNA that I was capable of being grateful, but now it's an active part of my day. And honestly, better things happen when I'm happy with what I have. And I think that's just where artists need to be to survive in this in this modern world is come from a position where you're happy to share. Not like it's owed to you. Nothing's owed to you. We're we are, you know, uh we get lucky enough to have our dreams come true. Be damn well sure to enjoy it. That was the prayer I I mean, the self prayer, manifestation, whatever you want to call it, mantra, affirmation. I would say on the set of Pirates every morning, I'd be suited up as this pirate and I would just have to take one little second to be thankful that I'm living what I wanted, you know? 
And when you do that, it's amazing because you're in the moment when you could easily be so full of shit and full of yourself. And you decide, no, this is when you really need to pull out the humble. Otherwise, the universe will body slam you and it's probably going to happen anyway. So, you know, just just know that we're just all humans and we all, you know, just try hard and be grateful for what you have, not what, what you don't have. And I think that's really the story of this interview. That's the theme of this interview. It has been an hour long of gratitude to share. And I got to share my gratitude with you as well for talking with me today. And I wanted to say it in there. You mentioned that your superpower was luck. I think your superpower is positivity because this has been, like I said, an hour of gratitude. I feel totally different than I did an hour ago. Uh, so thank yeah, you for sharing your stories. Thank you for being here. Oh, thank you. I really appreciate when you you put some thought and some research into what you do. And, you know, it was a classy interview, bro. I really enjoyed it. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, I, I hope you come out to the East Coast sometimes. I want to meet you in person and get a pic. But this has been awesome. And you are so wonderful. And I'm, again, very grateful that I got to spend this time with you, a face who I've seen for decades on TV and theaters. And now I'm spending an hour with this guy. So that's the coolest thing for me. Thank you, brother. Appreciate it. Great thank you so here. much. That's it for this week's episode of Trek Untold. Thank you for checking it out. Don't forget to follow us on social media, whether it's on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, or TikTok at Trek Untold, and subscribe wherever you are listening to or watching on. And that includes the audio versions on whatever platforms that might be and our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash at Trek Untold. If you'd like to support this show financially, please consider visiting patreon.com slash trekuntold to become a member of this show. And along with getting access to all sorts of wonderful perks, you'll also know that you're helping out this show continue to thrive, survive, and make new content all the time. I'm Matthew Kaplowitz. This has been Trek Untold. Thanks for watching. And until next time, always remember, fortune favors the bold. Trek Untold, the Star Trek podcast that goes beyond the stars, is powered by the Rageworks Podcast Network and affiliated with Nerd News Today.